Thank you so much, Audrey, for that really amazing presentation. Um, I know for me, there was a lot of new information there, things that I hadn't considered or thought about in terms of the experiences of older women who experience homelessness. Um, I'm waiting for some folks. I think people are just kind of catching up on the on the uh, the presentation. But while people are thinking through their questions that may have for you, I was I was actually really interested in this notion around the homemaker and people's identity as homemaker and how that um, influenced, um, I guess, the results or their stories or their experiences. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit more to that. Uh, thanks, Jesse, for your question. Um, I'm just wondering if everyone can hear me okay, just because there's a lawnmower going outside. Um, it... I can definitely hear you. I hear the okay. lawnmower too, but I can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, Oh, yeah, um, but yeah, that's a great question about uh, the notion of a homemaker. Um, in our research, uh, we found that um, that the home space is is an important um, is an important means through which people can exert control over their identity. Um, so, in that sense, uh, a home has historically been, you know the sphere of agency for many women, uh, for better or worse. And uh, from a life course theory perspective, uh, in which uh, people uh, people are shaped by not only th their, their interpersonal and social environments, but also historical time processes, um, this notion of the homemaker is something that's been historically ingrained um, throughout their life. So yeah, that's sort of where we're coming from. That makes so much sense. Thanks for speaking a bit more to that. I think I can even connect to that and I'm sure other people could as well, especially thinking through different generations and my grandparents um, to that notion of homemaker. Um, we have a question from Chelsea in the chat. So I just I will pose that question. So Chelsea asks, um, I've worked as a systems navigator for the past two years in a housing first program. Do you suggest working with the huge wait lists we often see with elder support, particularly low income folks? Or sorry, how do you suggest working with these huge wait lists? Yeah, that's a great question. And then I suppose that's something um, we're all grappling with uh, re regardless of which uh, populations we're, we're looking at. Um, yeah. We're still, we're still trying to, we're still struggling with how we can prioritize these populations um, in coordinated access uh, processes, uh, recognizing that older women are often overlooked and particularly vulnerable, um, yet not yet not reducing their vulnerabilities to things that can be checked off in a box. Uh, as for the, the wait lists, um, that, yeah, that's also tough when the housing, like affordable subsidized housing is just not available. So that's also something that we've been struggling with. Um, and I guess it's important to remember that a home is so much more than housing. So even though we can, like, even when we do get women into housing, a lot of them struggle to keep it because we did not address these underlying, you know, the underlying causes of intergenerational trauma and cycles of abuse. So I guess that's what we're trying to emphasize in this, in this um, presentation. In addition to housing availability, we also need to attend to all the things that, that make a house a home, especially for older women. Yeah, that's a really good point. That actually connects to a question that I had as well that was around um, this notion of home. And you you had said something in the presentation that even when people were actually housed, uh, they would maybe feel still uprooted or ungrounded. And so I was kind of thinking through this understanding of or, or how this, how people understood the term homelessness or home um, and whether they could be on, they could still be housed, but not really feel like they had a home. And if that came up, I mean, you just spoke to that, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit more because I find that fascinating. 
Thanks, Jesse. Um, that's a great question. Um, so in this study, even though the study project is called Solutions to Homelessness and Health in Older Women, we've been sort of reflecting on the language we've been using to, uh, to describe this population. And that's something that we're discussing with our research participants as well. We're trying to understand how they would like to describe themselves or how they see themselves. Um, as you mentioned, uh, some people can be without can be without physical housing and still feel a sense of home. So homelessness doesn't really capture their experience in that sense. Um, other on the other hand, we've had participants who um, who are housed but lack still lack that sense of home. So they prefer the interestingly enough they prefer prefer the term of homelessness. Um, some participants have preferred to describe themselves as uh, housing precarious, housing secure, and underhoused. Although um, those terms can be a bit more sterile, I, I suppose they don't capture the essence of a home either. Hmm. Um, yeah, so those are just sort of the discursive and rhet rhetorical tensions that we've been trying to understand as well. Yeah, those I find those conversations really fascinating and incredibly important. Thank you for grappling with those. Um, I just wanted to read a comment um, from Colette in the live chat as well. Colette wrote, I'm now 61. I was homeless at 50 years old. We had that community caring and connection and shelter. However, we lost it in housing. So that's really fascinating. And she continues, I'm happy to see this research being done, but the implementation and action towards addressing the experience of older women is sadly lacking. I don't know if you have any thoughts around how you're kind of contending with some of those issues in the in your study. Yeah, um, thank you, Colette. That's a really interesting insight. Um, yeah, it really speaks to how the sense of a home goes far beyond uh, physical housing. And uh, related to your point, uh, we've had some participants who felt more of a sense of community when they were living on the streets um, with their street family. And there's always that sense of protection and solidarity, even though, of course, it's still a very dangerous environment. And that's something that they weren't able to access in, uh, in like after they were physically housed. So yeah, thank you for that insight. Yeah, that's, that's something that I think many people are seeing. So you're talking about that in your research. And I think that's also across the board around social inclusion and you brought that up in your in your presentation this idea of social inclusion and what does that actually look like for the the participants that you spoke with was there anything else that came up around social inclusion that was really kind of fascinating and so far in your study um i think uh I mentioned this in, in the presentation, but I guess for the social inclusion piece, it really speaks to the importance of person-centered and trauma-informed care, which we're also seeing across the board in this conference. Um, you know, our participants were, they spoke to the, the cathartic and healing effect of having just like one personal advocate or, or several um, that accepted them for who they were. And I thought that was, that was quite powerful. That is really, yeah, that is really powerful. Yeah, and as we know, social exclusion is, um, you know, it's structural in nature, but we can, we can begin to counter structural discrimination at the interpersonal level, I suppose, in, um, in these caring environments and at the point of care in a lot of housing and healthcare services. I think this kind of connects to um, another question that Chelsea had which is what prompted you to want to research this area? Mm -hmm. um, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, so, um, so during my master's degree, I, uh, which was on uh, food insecurity, uh, the political economy of food insecurity in Canada, um, I became familiar with the social determinants of health framework, which, um, which many of you are knowledgeable about as well. And that was more coming from the structural, structural perspective. You know, it's, it's quite top down or not top down, sorry. Um, 
it's, you know, it's talking about how our social locations uh, shape health outcomes and are mediated through social institutions. Um, uh, following my master's degree, I worked in uh, the HIV and AIDS field uh, for a year, and um, that was coming more from a care perspective. Um, so through that experience, I, uh, you know, I became more familiar with uh, the significance of, of interpersonal relationships in, in determining and improving health outcomes. And I sort of wanted to bridge the two. And while I was working for the BC Center of HIV and AIDS, um, you know, we, we were also, our research study engaged with a very marginalized population that uh, overlaps with uh, homelessness and um, substance using populations. And that's sort of how I came across this PhD opportunity. I wanted to reconcile these institutional and interpersonal approaches and also, um, and, and also, yeah, work towards uh, justice for social groups that ex experience profound social exclusion and, and marginalization. Well, thank you for doing this work that you do. Um, I think it's incredibly important and I, I can see that many people agree. Um, I, I really appreciated that you spoke about how uh, women's homelessness is often hidden as well and it's not quite as visible. And um, I think that's such an important point because you don't necessarily, our images, our understanding of homelessness um, and how policies are created um, based on this understanding of homelessness and definitions of homelessness um, have often excluded more invisible forms of homelessness. And so our solutions aren't necessarily tailored to, to people who occupy more invisible forms of homelessness. Did I know you spoke about it in your presentation a bit, but I was wondering if you could tease that out a little bit more, the invisibility of homelessness or how that was um, spoken to or spoken about. Right. Um, so women's homelessness is often invisible because women tend to relate, rely on relational support such as uh, family and friends or engage in survival strategies such as uh, couch surfing or sex work. And um, these are all supports that, ex that sort of exist outside of the labor, housing, labor and housing market as well as our social institutions. And for that reason, they're often not recognized or invisible in that sense. Um, a lot of shelter environments don't recognize women's circumstances of being how of being underhoused as homelessness in, in the first place, uh, which is problematic. And, and also, for instance, uh, for women who are either forced to stay with their abusers or fleeing from abusers, uh, their circumstances are often not recognized as homelessness either uh, within the shelter and homelessness sector. Um, yeah, I, I would guess, I guess those are the main sources of invisibility. And also um, back to the, ho the, the idea of the homemaker, I guess it's a double-edged sword because although it provides them a sense of comfort and agency within the home space, it also sequesters them um, from society at large. So I guess we want to shed light on these relational networks and empower them to, to continue engaging in these networks, but, but also supporting them to be able to do so. I, I really like that point. And it connects to a comment in the live chat that um, Rayma mentioned of even during the war, women lived together to support each other. Opportunities in housing for women to support each other but still have privacy is so important. And that kind of kind of picks up on what you were just saying about um, interrelational, like we really need to strengthen communities and strengthen interrelational um, experiences and, and relation, interrelational relationships, is that a phrase? But yeah, um, strengthen those ties. Thank you for that. Um, Chelsea also made the great point that um, Jesse Thistle's indigenous definition of homelessness um, intersects with this work and kind of these different understandings of home. And I, I wanted to also ask that, well, I don't know if you have any thoughts around that before I ask my other question, but this idea of, um, yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, thanks, Chelsea. Um, 
I, I've, uh, I've, I've read Jesse Thistle's uh, work on all my relations before, and, and I'm not familiar with it, but that's a great point. And that's an, that's a, and given that Indigenous women are overrepresented in, um, in the, in populations that are experiencing housing precarity, housing insecurity, I think that that's a great connection and, and a way to make our work more intersectional. So thank you. And kind of picking up on that, I also just wanted to ask if um, the issue of uh, racism came up in your, has come up in your work, and if so, how or what, what has that looked like? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, given that our studies in Victoria, BC, which tends to be a more homo racially homogeneous um, city, uh, we haven't encountered uh, overt racism so much yet. Although, um, although one of our co-researchers is indigenous and it's quite clear to see how her circumstances um, stem from, you know, these intergenerational cycles of colonial violence and and trauma. So I guess it, that's where the racism comes in. It's it's from it's from that institutional level. Mm. But I also don't doubt that that, that racialized individuals probably like probably do experience instances of racism within housing environments, even though we haven't spoken to them so much about that yet. Right. Okay. Amazing. Well, not amazing that that's happening, but it's just amazing work that you're that you're doing. So I'm I'm grateful for you um, expanding on that a bit. Um, I think that covers all the questions that have shown up in the in the Q and A and in the live chat. Uh, I might give another couple seconds for anyone if they want to add anything else in the live chat or in the Q and A session. Um, and while I do that, I also um, just want to thank everyone for being here and Audrey thank you for your presentation um, it was it was pretty fantastic and I know that I learned a lot um, a small plug um, for you as well but there's the Women's National Housing and Homelessness Network that's tied to the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness and they're a great um, network for folks who are interested in working on or participating in um, lots of different research and advocacy and different initiatives related to women and gender diverse people's um, experiences of homelessness or being unhoused. Um, so that would be a great place. It's for people with lived experience, it's for researchers, it's for everybody. So definitely look that up because that really connects to your work quite closely. Um, so thank you, thank you everyone for coming. Did you wanna, sorry, you unmuted and I interrupted. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you, Jesse, um, for summarizing my, my key points so succinctly and, um, and helping me field all these questions. And thank you, everyone, for your thought provoking insights. And, um, and, and yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Just this last comment from somebody in the chat from Colette says, thanks so much, Audrey. I'm the subject of your research. It makes me feel seen. Uh, and I think that that's pretty incredible. And I, that kind of I think that's amazing. I think that's your work is incredibly important and that's right there is one of the main reasons why. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, there is a closing ceremony coming up at 2.45. So just a reminder about that and it will include uh, the closing prayer. So we'll see you all then and take good care. <laughs>